thank you, Terry, and thank all your lovely group who uh, came out from Milwaukee, a, uh, a city that I know and love well. Um, my niece, Rebecca, is, a, is the head of the freshwater biology lab at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee there, uh, where the Milwaukee River runs out into the lake. And, uh, uh, and so I come and visit once a year or so. I was just there a few months ago. And uh, it's a great hearted city with uh, wonderful people. And uh, I spent my early summers on my uncle's farm in northern Wisconsin, up in Langley County, up near Rhineland or Eagle River. And uh, so I'm familiar with, uh, uh, with holds a, Wisconsin holds a dear uh, spot in my heart on many levels. Um, just want to talk to you for 10, 15 minutes and then open it up for questions, because I'm sure there's probably a bunch. Um, uh, just having a look at folks uh, in the audience here, people seem to be in various stages of uh, progress in their journey towards uh, better health. Um, and so let me start with an apology um, on behalf of my noble medical profession, um, who's been treating you um, for the past however many years you've been on this planet, uh, as if what you were, have been eating has no effect on your body whatsoever. And uh, uh, those of you who uh, come in with various medical problems, high blood pressure, diabetes, clogged arteries, high lipids, uh, well, it's just your genetics or whatever, take this pill, come back and see me in a month. And for all of you who have received that kind of medicine uh, over your lifetime. I apologize. I'm embarrassed by my profession. I'm angry at my profession for scientists who can detect the a, a genetic mismatch on gene A21 on chromosome 14. Boy, that they can home in with precision. But the thought that our patients eating cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizzas might be hurting their arteries with that diet, this is somehow escaped uh, the scientific reasoning of my colleagues. And it's, 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 a, it's an atrocious uh, um, oversight. Uh, we can talk about where that may have come from, but the fact is it's the reality that most doctors practicing today uh, never ask about their patient's diet. We're not trained uh, to know what to do with the answer. We, most doctors don't believe that their patient's diet has anything to do with these diseases. And most doctors are eating the same foods themselves. They're eating their burgers and pizzas and fried chicken. They're, they're not going to tell their patients not to eat the stuff. And you wind up with, with the embarrassing spectacle of physicians with big pot bellies and pockets full of statins and lisinopril themselves. And uh, then, in my opinion, that, that's no way to inspire the healing changes in your patients. A, a physician should be healthy people and set off set a, a healthy example for their patients. Uh, and so the reality is, uh, as after you heard 45 years of, uh, of clinics and emergency rooms and blood and guts medicine, it's become very evident that the uh, majority of people that are sitting in the waiting rooms of emergency rooms and outpatient clinics and surgical uh, uh, facilities and uh, pediatric clinics, the, the majority of them are there. Um, because of what they're eating. Um, the Western diet has become so toxic um, with uh, uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast and cheeseburgers for lunch and chicken for dinner and even the salmon and the, and the low-fat dairy and all that stuff. It, it still continues, to, I mean, especially when you combine it you know, with the vegetable oils and the refined sugars and the high fructose corn syrup and all the preservatives and chemicals, etc. The um, the food uh, mixture that we are flowing through our cells hour after hour, day after day, month after month, uh, causes uh, uh, dysfunction. Uh, these foods uh, turn genes on, they turn genes off. Every uh, meal now we recognize changes us. It flows through our cells where our DNA lies unfolded. And the food that we eat flows through our tissues and they, and they play our DNA like a piano. And they turn genes on, they turn genes off. They set inflammation on, they, um, they turn immunity off. Um, the, the food changes us on a genetic molecular level, but my colleagues don't want to believe that either. But it's obviously true, there's a whole science devoted to that at this point. And, and as these, uh, as this pathogenic diet percolates through the tissues, it sets off uh, various uh, uh, illnesses, dysfunction. 
And depending on your genetics, that will determine which specialist office you'll find yourself sitting in. Uh, but the reality is that the, uh, as, the, as this disease-producing food stream flows through our tissues, uh, the internist sees the clogged arteries and the cardiologist sees the atherosclerosis and the high lipids and the rheumatologist sees the sore joints and the gastroenterologist sees the colitis and the Crohn's disease and the dermatologist sees the psoriasis and the pulmonologist sees the asthma. Uh, guess what? They're all looking at the same disease. It's what their patients are eating. And the reality is you get these folks on a whole food, plant-based diet. You have them eat oatmeal and fruit in the morning um, with a non-dairy milk. Uh, and lunches and dinners are big salads and hearty vegetable soups and big plates of steamed green yellow veggies and, veg and lentil stews and bean chilies and, and East Indian curries and Chinese stir fries and you know, lovely fruits for dessert. You run a whole food, plant-based diet through the human body day after day. And these diseases go away. And, I, and in these last 35 years of my career, I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times. You get these folks on a healthy whole food, not, not Oreos and granola bars, but, but real whole foods, real salads, real soups. And within days, the, the changes are stunning. The obesity starts to melt away and the uh, arteries open up and the high blood pressure comes down and the insulin receptors clear out. The diabetes goes away and the joints stop hurting and the psoriatic skin clears up and the bowel movements to revert to normal again. And, and people turn into normal, healthy people uh, without the needs of a lot of pills and potions and procedures. And you get them off their medications. Uh, they no longer have high blood pressure. You wind up stopping the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors. And then the diabetes goes away. And you get them off the metformin and off the insulin injections. And then they turn into healthy people, which is our birthright. And yet nobody is telling the young medical students this. It's all just genetics and mess around with their metformin dosage and come back and see me in a month. And, oh, we better raise your statin dosage. Heaven forbid you should tell them to stop eating the cheeseburgers. But, well, we need more statins this month. Well, doctor, why don't you ask them what they're eating? You know, before you order another, and I tell the young medical students this, before you order another $1,000 scan, another $500 set of blood tests, stop. Ask your patient what they ate yesterday. Have them take them through yesterday's eating day. And if it's full of Egg McMuffins and, and Buffalo wings, and, and even wild-caught salmon and low-fat dairy, stop. That, that's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor, now all clogged up, overweight, hypertensive, and inflamed. Get them on a healthy plant-based diet. These diseases go away. You want to heal these patients or don't you, is what I ask the medical students as I go around to the, to the medical schools. <clears throat> uh, and, and that's really the issue, because these are, these are all reversible diseases. And, and yet nobody's telling the young docs about this. And it's just etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of these diseases. Nonsense is what they're eating. Yes, there's a genetic component. And yes, there's a lifestyle component. And you, you, know, you got to stop the smoking and take a walk every day and reduce the stress. That's all important. But, but overwhelmingly, it's the food we're eating. And you get folks on a healthy diet. They turn people into healthy human beings. So uh, for the past eight years, I've been on the staff at True North Health Center in San Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco, and watch nutritional medicine do its magic, and we get folks on healthy diets, and they turn into healthy people. After eight years of doing that, I, I got the idea how nutritional medicine works. Uh, so I left uh, True North Health Center. Um, about a year and a half ago, and I'm devoting the rest of my medical career to going around to the medical schools and give those young students the lecture I wish somebody had given me 50 years ago, that you're not going to be seeing leprosy and smallpox kids, even though you're learning about it and how to diagnose and treat it. That's not what you're going to be seeing in your career. It's going to be obesity and clogged arteries and diabetes and inflammatory disease from what your patients are eating. And your, and your professors aren't going to tell you that. Your, your textbooks aren't going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you that. Because it's the truth of it. And somebody needs to tell this to you. And so we've started a nonprofit uh, initiative called Moving Medicine Forward. Uh, and basically, I'm going around to the schools and, and giving those students that lecture. 
And then for, and we formed nutrition interest groups to keep the enthusiasm going. Uh, so uh, uh, we, I Skype in once a month. We discuss nutrition-based cases. We want to get nutrition taught in all four years of medical school. So, so every newly graduated physician, of course, asks his patients what they're eating. Of course, they understand clinical nutrition. That's where we're trying to get Western medicine, where it should have been all along. Truth of it is. So uh, if you're interested in my work, um, go to my website. Terry can give you the website. It's drclapper.com, spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com. And if you go to my website, you'll see up on top, it says Moving Medicine Forward. Click on Moving Medicine Forward. You'll, you'll see a page devoted on uh, 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 to our work. And uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, a little green panel that says, if you know a medical student, um, or, a, or a doctor or a surgeon, somebody on staff at um, a medical school who would be open to this message to having Dr. Clapper come and speak, click here and give us their information. We will contact them and uh, we'll hopefully arrange a, a, a lecture at their med school. I would love to come to uh, Milwaukee and to Madison and, uh, and, and talk to the faculty and students there. So anyway, so um, I'm full-time now doing Moving Medicine Forward because we need to move medicine forward into the 21st century. Uh, it's embarrassing. Uh, that my profession has been hanging back so long. And again, I apologize that your doctors never asked you about nutrition. If you've got one, I hear you've got somebody out uh, west there who's a plant-based doc. Yay to that person. And if they're st starting to happen. The nutritional awakening is starting to happen slowly, but it's, uh, it's, I'm very grateful for it. And more and more plant-based physicians are, um, are awakening uh, now. Now, as Terry mentioned, there's a program, the, the organization, the Plantrition Project, who uh, uh, meets once a year. We're in Oakland this year. And uh, plant-based physicians from around the world, we had over a 1,000 plant-based doctors last year. They come from everywhere, from Ireland and India and Israel and New Zealand and, and Australia. They're they're happening all over. Uh, it's, it's an exciting time, finally, uh, to uh, be a plant-based physician. But anyway, this is where medicine should be. It's where it's slowly going to. And, uh, and the message is one of hope. Uh, everybody's got their own body and their own history. But by and large, the majority of diseases, bringing it back to us tonight here, what, if you are someone with a medical condition for which you take medications. If you've got a medicine cabinet home full of statins and beta blockers and, and ACE inhibitors and, and uh, hypoglycemics and the usual, know that unless you've really done severe damage to your body, most of these diseases are reversible. Uh, you run a healthy diet through that body day after day. Man, within three weeks, six weeks, Boy, you're, you're off your medications, your body's working good. It's, it's the most remarkable transformation in medicine. I wish someone had told me about it at the beginning of my career. But anyway, great hope for individuals. Uh, and we can talk about your individual case, um, if, if you'd like, uh, in, in a minute or so. Um, so good news for the medical profession, um, as much as they would rather stay back in the 18th century. We're going to drag them kicking and screaming into the 21st where they belong. And, uh, and good news for you as individuals, that so your body knows how to heal itself. We are essentially plant-based eating folks. Uh, we have the same digestive system, roughly, that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. And they're up in the trees tonight eating leaves and fruit. And if we run a predominantly, if not completely, whole food plant-based diet through our system, uh, we turn into healthy beings again. That, that's the take-home message. How to do it, uh, Terry Lynch has lots of information. Go to the Engine 2 website, go to the Forks Over Knives website. Uh, there, there's lots of websites to learn how to do this. But learn how to make a few good breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, eat a little big salad every day, and don't eat the meat and the cheese and the dairy and the oils and the flour products and all those things making you fat and sick. And, uh, and poof, uh, watch this amazing transformation happen. Your body knows how to do it. It's, I wish someone had told me that, too, 50 years ago. Anyway, better late than ever. So that's basically what I wanted to say. That's a bit of who I am and uh, what we're all doing here tonight. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got the rest of my uh, afternoon and evening free, so I'm uh, glad to hang in with you folks and, 
uh, answer as many questions till Terry gets the electronic book and, uh, and gets me off stage here. So, um, uh, Terry, if you'd like to take your way and be the MC, uh, I'll be glad to open it up for questions. I'm going I'm to ask one or two questions first. And then you bet. So, yeah, and you mentioned what a wonderful thing, how remarkable it is with uh, somebody who has a, a chronic disease and uh, how quickly they can begin to heal uh, by, by just uh, changing what they put at the end of the report. How about, and I know you've had, you've had over 40 years experience, I've heard you talk about this before, the younger people who, uh, you know, a young mom, uh, an infant, uh, you've had, what, three generations or so of, of patients that you took care of where you, you took people from uh, conception, I mean, uh, all the way through until it became adults and then began taking care of your children. So on the, for the people who are already somewhat healthy or, or they haven't begin to, begun to see the, uh, what's going to happen from eating meat and cheese yet, it's just building up inside of them. What have you seen uh, happen to these uh, younger people, either who were plant-based all their lives or made the change before they began to see any uh, disease problems? Uh, that's such an important point, Terry. Thank you very much. Um, Again, you know, these diseases, the high blood pressure, uh, the diabetes, and especially their evil sequelae, the strokes and the heart attack, these, uh, these things don't fall out of a tree on you at age 55 while you're out for a walk. Uh, I had a wise professor in medical school say, you know, people, they, they don't get diseases. They earn them. You know, the meal after meal, argument after argument, cigarette after cigarette, after drink, drink after drink, sleepless night after sleepless night, the cheeseburger after cheeseburger. Yeah, these repeated assaults. In my slideshow, I have a picture of the Grand Canyon with the Colorado River at the bottom. I said, the Colorado River cut the, cut the Grand Canyon day after day after day after day. This is the power of persistence. And you put bad food through your blood and through your tissues, meal after meal, month after month, year after year, you're going to create diseases. But you put healthy food through your tissues, salad after soup, after steamed veggie, after chili, you know, healthy bean chili, after healthy lentil soup. Um, as the weeks and the months go by, you turn on the good genes and these diseases go away. And um, people need to know that, that you know, that power you know, is for real. And what you said about the young people, uh, again, these diseases don't magically appear in, in your 50s. Uh, <clears throat> A, a real jolting um, uh, assessment was delivered to me by one of my pediatric colleagues. He says, you know, Doc, the biggest killer in America, atherosclerosis, clogging of the arteries, atherosclerosis is a pediatric disease. And as soon as he said that, I wouldn't mean atherosclerosis is a pediatric disease. It's true. When, when they do autopsies on kids killed in car accidents at age 10, 11, already they got this yellow atherosclerotic gut building up in their arteries from the burgers and the hot dogs and the pizzas. And, the, and you know, it's, it's, these diseases start in childhood, the obesity, the, the inflammatory diseases the, from the leaky gut, those guts get injured, meal after meal of endotoxin-laced meats and, and alcohols and, uh, and high sugar foods, etc. This is what injures the gut wall allows food to leak out into the bloodstream, flow through joint membranes, and set off the arthritis and the, and the, uh, the asthma, etc. Uh, and again, this happens in youth. And, and, and we see that you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a young person's disease. Crohn's disease of the, of the intestine, these are young people's diseases. And instead of just clucking the tongue, oh, what happened so early in their life? Yeah, it did, because of what they've been eating the last 15 years, uh, injuring those gut walls, etc. cetera. The, the body is not capricious. That's an old-time word you don't hear much about. Uh, capricious doesn't jump from one place to another, to another, to another, you know, like, like a goat does. Uh, uh, the body doesn't decide, well, I think I'll whip up an autoimmune disease today. I think I'll whip up... Um, uh, inflammatory joint disease. It doesn't do that. You know, they're, 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 these diseases happen, it happens for a reason, because there's repetitive insults that, that threw some important system off balance. And, uh, and 
and and they and they happen earlier in life. And when you're 24, man, you think you can eat anything and you're going to live forever. I remember that. But uh, the body's never not looking. There's no fooling it. it every one of those meals, um, you know, inflicts some damage and it has a uh, uh, has a price. The good news is the body knows how to repair itself, and membranes repair themselves, and inflammation subsides, and you know, hormone imbalances re rebalance. The body can heal itself, but you got to give it a break. If you keep hitting yourself in the head with a hammer three times a day, the headache's never going to go away. You stop hitting yourself in the head with a hammer and the headaches go away. You know, it's not that profound to understand. Uh, well, same thing with the body. But uh, again, uh, just because you're young is no reason to think, well, I can eat whatever I want. I'll clean up my diet later. Uh, as soon as you think about it is the time to, to clean up your diet. So, uh, and again, what, you know, the big sacrifice is ordering the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, that's, a, that's this huge sacrifice we're being able to, we're being asked to make. But that's, you know, symbolic for all that that implies, of course, you know, always choosing the plant-based option over the, the, the meat-based one. But really, you know, the flavoring is in the beans and in the sauce and et cetera. There's no big sacrifice in stopping the flesh and the dairy and the oils and the flower products. These are what's keeping us fat and sick. Uh, and you run on whole plant foods and I never think twice about going back for another helping of vegetable soup or whatever. It's vegetable soup. It's all fiber and water. It runs right through you. This food is guilt-free eating. Uh, never think twice about portion control or calorie counting, anything like that. I just eat food. And I've just turned 72. I'm, I, I go out for 20-mile bike rides. I feel healthy. I'm on no medications. And I should be a normal 72-year-old guy like everybody else should be. Uh, and... Uh, and that's the beauty of healthy food. It creates a healthy body. Uh, health comes from healthy living, as my friend Dr. Goldhammer says, and, and he's right. So the invitation is to stop kidding yourself. I've got a slide that says, welcome to camp, stop kidding yourself. And, and basically, that's what your body's asking. You know? So we're, we're not flesh-eating apes, no matter what the keto and the paleo folks are spouting out. Well, that's not who we are. No, we, again, we are you know, we're carbohydrate-eating organisms. Mitochondria and ourselves burn sugars. We don't burn fats uh, preferentially. We are sugar burning creatures. And, uh, and a, a whole plant based diet provides those carbohydrates in a healthy manner. So, um, anyway, long answer, but yes, just because you're young, you, that's the best time to start eating healthy. Don't wait till you're 60 and fat and diabetic and hypertensive with, with blown out knees. Um, so start early and keep your body healthy cruise through your 70s and 80s and 90s. That's the way it's supposed to go. Thanks, Mike. Calista? Um, can the plant-based diet be sweet based on your illness? Did you hear uh, that? No, uh, it's all garbled, so please repeat the question, Siri. All right, can the plant-based, or should the plant-based diet be tweaked depending on, upon your illness, if, if you have an illness? Seems sweet, S-W-E-E-T? No, should a plant-based diet be uh, modified based upon the, uh, uh, an illness, if you have an illness? Yes. Uh, wow, very astute question. Of course, and, and I'm going to try not to ramble too much here, um, but um, there are some uh, foods in the plant-based kingdom. If, you, if, you're, if they're, again, if you're really doing this in the pure spirit, in other words, you know, it's it's become almost one word, whole food plant-based. But those are some important terms. Whole food, stop, right there, okay. We're talking about food that you're about to put in your mouth that you could identify if it was growing in the garden. That leaf of lettuce, um, that tomato, uh, that corn on the cob, that's the foods we're talking about. If it's coming out of a package or a box that's got ingredients on it, right away, we're not talking the same selection of foods here. Um, if these are whole food plant-based, we're talking about whipping up a really hearty vegetable soup or stew, steaming up some uh, some kale or broccoli and, and squash, uh, making up a, a colorful salad, um, some healthy starches, uh, sweet potato, uh, some leguminous on a lentil uh, hummus sandwich, a lentil stew, a bean burrito, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> not without with 
Lancy Bean Burrito, no meat or cheese, just a, you know, with all the trimmings, with the salsa and all that. Um, <clears throat> as long as you're whole foods that you can identify, there's little modification needed. Um, when, uh, when, as soon as you start uh, low-fat cookies and all that, if it comes out of packaging by the processed food, stay away from that because because that's what's causing a lot of the issues. But getting back to your the original question, um, the folks who have really severe Crohn's disease, they're in, in, in the early stages of their inflammatory bowel disease and their intestines are red and swollen and bleeding and they're having five bloody stools a day. Ooh, these folks shouldn't be eating a lot of fruit. Um, fruit sugars are a laxative and they, they can make things a bit worse. Um, the folks with the red hot rheumatoid joints or the lupus joints, they often don't do well on on a lot of legumes um, or uh, nightshades, the, the tomatoes and the eggplants and green peppers. So, so there's a subtle, uh, by and large, everybody does fine on the basic, on the in, uh, healthy starches, quinoa or, or, or rice uh, are, should be fine. Um, the uh, green vegetables, everybody does well, by and large, on kale and chard and, uh, and, uh, and broccoli. Yellow vegetables, green and yellow you should have every day. Something green, as I said, kale, chard, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Uh, something yellow, carrots, squash, sweet potatoes, yams, etc. Everybody does well on those. Uh, it's the, either the sugary things that, that, the, that the gut people need to avoid, the, um, the nightshades and, 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 uh, and some legumes. Um, uh, from the uh, inflammatory joint folks. Uh, there might be a couple other subtle uh, uh, variations on that. Basically, the, the beauty of this food is it's so forgiving that, um, you know, eat what you want, as long as it's a can, whole food, you know, plant food that that's, you know, whole food has been processed. And if the next day, if your symptoms are worse, if, you're, if your joints are more sore, your skins are more broken out, your guts are more inflamed, whatever, but whatever your particular disease might be, if it's worse, then say, okay, no, no big penalty. Stop and say, all right, what did I eat yesterday? Something, something was going through that I didn't agree with. And pick out the most likely uh, culprits and uh, eliminate them from your diet for the next four or five days. If your symptoms cool, you know, get better then you might want to have one of the suspect foods again. If your joints get worse or your skin gets worse, that's, that's all you need to know. Okay, don't eat that food for a good six months uh, and until uh, your disease goes away, and then, then you can reintroduce them. So that's a, the rudiments of, a, of an elimination diet. Uh, so uh, it depends on the individual person. You know, Some foods will bother you or it won't bother me. Um, but give it a try. If anything is suspected of making your symptoms worse, then don't eat it for a few months and then, then reintroduce it again. Uh, it's just food, and, and most folks do fine with, with all the plant foods. And, uh, to try and get uh, maybe five or six more uh, in here. Okay, I'll try and make it shorten the questions and answers. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Dr. Clapper. Um, hi. What would you suggest for a person who has been whole food, plant-based, no oil for many years, but nevertheless still cannot reach the magic uh, 150 uh, heart attack proof cholesterol number? And Thank you. Are there some foods that a person like that should emphasize in their diet that would help to get that number lower? Good question. Uh, first of all, um, a high um, uh, cholesterol can be driven by um, hypothyroid, low thyroid function can raise your cholesterol. And vegans who don't consume enough iodine in their diet may be giving themselves subclinical hypothyroidism that shows up with a high cholesterol. So, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Need some rock. Traveler's cold here. <clears throat> You just um, from a bowl. So um, make sure you have around between 150 to 200 micrograms of iodine in your diet uh, most days, three to five days a week. Uh, you go a sprinkle of kelp powder, uh, crumble up some wakame or dulse uh, into your salad or your soup, um, or take um, a multivitamin that's got, uh, got some iodine in it. So make sure you're not looking at some clinical um, uh, hypothyroidism. Uh, on Monday, I am going to be recording 
um, a, um, a video that you'll be welcome to view later next week um, called Beyond Cholesterol. And it deals with this very question. I've got so many people who've got cholesterol, they can't get below 180. In my humble opinion, it doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why is this, and I know Terry, you're looking for short answers. This isn't uh, gonna be one, but um, the, all the cardiologists are so focused on these freaking numbers. Oh, your cholesterol is 212, then you need so much statins, because they're afraid of getting sued if, if they've got someone with a high cholesterol that isn't treated with statins. Um, I would get all the cardiologists in the room and tell them, doctors, it is, the question is not how high is your cholesterol. These plaques do not form on the artery walls because their LDL is too high. These are inflammatory lesions. These, are, these plaques are forming because these arteries are being injured meal after meal with fried vegetable oils and cooked animal protein and high frequency corn syrup and cigarette smoke and, and stress hormones and uh, and uh, um, chlorinated drinking water and food with pesticides. Modern di modern diet is an assault on the artery walls and each each one of these uh, fried you know, fried eggs uh, after you know, you know, followed by cheeseburgers followed by Colonel Sanders. So this is what is injuring those artery walls. And, and starting off this plaque formation, which is which is made worse by all the, the cholesterol that people are eating. If, if you, two things to understand, cholesterol is not an evil molecule. Um, your adrenals make cortisol out of it. Your testicles make testosterone out of it if you have one. Your ovaries make estrogens out of cholesterol. It's not an evil molecule. That's why your liver makes it. The real issue is not how high is your cholesterol. The question is how healthy your arteries. How is the owner of the arteries treating those artery walls? If he's Joe Six Pack Pizza and Burger Eater, um, who's drinking his Cokes and, uh, and uh, eating his pieces and all that stuff, he should be worried about that cholesterol of 210 or 220. But if, you've, if, but if this is a healthy Sally or, or, or Sam vegan, who is just meal after meal, he's just running greens and soups and salads and vegetables and rice through those artery walls, he's not doing that. He's not causing those repetitive injuries. She's not ripping up the, her artery linings to create this plaque formation. She's not going to be developing these plaques, even though her liver may need, well, I need to keep 212 milligrams of cholesterol up there so her adrenals can get on with her steroid synthesis. The, the, there's a difference between hyper, you know, and a quote, elevated cholesterol level, but in, again, in a healthy vegan, not eating anybody else's cholesterol, um, I don't view a cholesterol 180 or 210 as terribly abnormal as what their body needs um, to, um, uh, to get on with their, their steroid synthesis. Um, among the meat eaters, these, cholesterol, these high cholesterol levels are associated with heart attacks and strokes because of the way the meat eaters are treating their arteries. It's not the cholesterol, it's a, it's a symbol it's, it's a marker for those folks who are injuring their arteries with the rest of their diet. So um, in medical terms, I would tell my colleagues, there's a difference between the, the entity of hypercholesterol, hypercholesterolemia, slightly elevated cholesterol in the blood, versus the disease process of atherosclerosis which is an inflammatory fire burning in the walls of the arteries due to how the owner of those arteries are treating those artery walls. If you're not doing that to your artery walls, I don't particularly care that your liver needs to keep 180 milligrams of cholesterol. And because uh, all those studies showing high cholesterols um, associated with heart attacks and strokes are done on meat eating folks. When the cardiologist opens his waiting room door and looks in there, every overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged artery patient he's got, they're all eating burgers and pizzas, which he never or she never tells them to stop eating. So yes, the, he thinks they're all going to get heart attacks and strokes. They will, doctor, because you don't tell them to change their diet. But in this room of people, which I assume or hope are mostly plant-eating folks, and you're not doing that to your arteries. I don't particularly care if your cholesterol is 178 or 1 or 204. It doesn't matter. You're not going to get the disease of atherosclerosis. 
Now, there are inflammatory markers. If you want to know, I don't particularly care what your LDL is, but I do want to know what your inflammatory markers, what your high sensitivity CRP is, what your myeloperoxy. There, there are markers that your cardiologist can, or, can order to see if, the, if that inflammatory fire is burning at the walls of your arteries. Um, and, and if you tune in to next week to my website, uh, click on the video beyond cholesterol, and it'll have all those markers uh, evaluated there for you. So this lovely man who's um, still got that elevated cholesterol, whatever it is, it's not below that magic 150. That magic 150 number is in, in the cheeseburger eaters. But these studies are never done on vegans. They're never done on plant-eating folks. They, they don't know if a, if a cholesterol of 190 or 210 in a healthy the low stress vegan is a dangerous number. I suspect it's not. And, uh, but realize these numbers don't apply to the healthy plant based eating folks. But all the cardiologists are there, oh, those numbers, oh, cholesterol is too damn, you need statins, so I don't get sued. But, but they're, they're, again, they're, they're not even looking in the right door there. What, they should be asking, what do you want my patient eating? I, I can't, their diet, and these numbers will fade into insignificance. So long answer, but don't worry about it. If you're a healthy plant-based guy, go get your arteries checked. If, if your inflammatory markers are negative, which they will be, but don't get your cholesterol checked again. This doesn't make any difference. Yes, Terry. Great. <clears throat> uh, is peripheral neuropathy treatable or not? Um, diabetic neuropathy? Um, yes, um, absolutely. I should put this on my website as well. But Dr. Milton Crane, um, if you if you diagnose if you do a search on Dr. Milton Crane, C R A N E, and you put in um, uh, diabetic neuropathy, um, you'll see that uh, he put folks on a really strict plant based diet, gave them a whopping dose of B twelve uh, shot every day, and within excuse me, 14 days, two weeks, um, the majority of his diabetic neuropathy patients were symptom-free. Um, so uh, his protocol is worthwhile. Cleaning up your diet and, and upping your B12 is worthwhile. Um, however, that said, I find uh, if, if we are talking about just in your feet or your legs, before you assume that it's diabetic neuropathy and your doctor may say, oh, diabetic patient got neuropathy, uh, the majority of them uh, are folks with a numb and tingly feet, um, don't have true diabetic neuropathy. They've got lumbar disc disease. They, they've got a lumbar disc that is pushing on their L5 nerve roots. And so before you chalk this up to diabetic neuropathy, insist if you haven't had one, that your doctor order an MRI of your lumbar spine and make sure that this is not lumbar disc disease uh, pushing on your nerve roots there. That turns out to be far more common than true diabetic neuropathy. But if you do have a diabetic neuropathy, uh, then Dr. Crane's uh, uh, low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet with a thousand mites of B12 every day and see if that doesn't uh, improve your symptoms. What's uh, the question is, do you have a, a program, a basic uh, program to jumpstart reversal of diabetes? Um, yes, the, um, the best one um, would be uh, Dr. Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes, although Dr. Furman's are really, is really good as well. But uh, there's an excellent book called Dr. Barnard's Program for Reversing Diabetes. Uh, it's Neil Barnard's from PCRM. You can get it off their website. And uh, he's got just a great program in there. It's a, it's a small book. You can read it in the evening. Uh, and I uh, would get on his program. But diabetes should go away. If you, if you still have a pancreas that puts out any insulin at all, you, uh, you trim down to a healthy body weight and, that, and, and the diabetes should go away. And diabetes is a disease of fat toxicity. You're, I'll come, if you've got classic type 2 diabetes, it's because of fat in your diet. And I'm not causing any, casting any aspersions on anybody here. But it's the cheese, it's the vegetable oil, the olive oil, the coconut oil, and you know, all this processed oil, the, you know, the chicken fat, the fish oil, all this stuff is clogging up your insulin receptors so insulin can't get in and work. Stop the stop the fat. I'm not saying fats are evil, but get it out of whole foods. Get it out of a, a handful of walnuts, 
uh, and uh, some flax seeds, uh, sprinkled on your oatmeal. Uh, get your fats from there. A quart of an avocado is fine. But stop all these oils and, and the dairy and the, you know, the processed foods. Uh, and, and the insulin receptors open up and the diabetes just goes away. So it's, it's don't, you know, the people that don't eat carbs, the carbs aren't the problem. It's the fats that are up the insulin receptors. Once your insulin receptors are clogged up, yes, you need carbohydrates, uh, especially refined ones, and they're going to go up. They're going to say, see, those carbs are bad. But it's because the fat is clogging up your insulin receptors. If you want to get rid of, of the junk fats, the insulin receptors open up and the carbohydrates uh, take care of themselves. Did you, did you ever hear that? Oh, sure. Um, do you have any words of wisdom for somebody with crystal clear coronary arteries that has heart failure? Did you hear that? No, I didn't, Terry. Do you have any uh, advice for somebody who has crystal clear arteries but has heart failure? Heart failure. Oh, my. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, tricky business. That gets into fairly sophisticated cardiology. There are cardiomyopathies where, there, where there's been either a viral infection that has damaged the heart muscle fibers. There are metabolic cardiomyopathies like amyloidosis um, that, that is injuring the muscle fibers. Um, you need a, either a little, a good cardiologist, you need to do a little cardiac biopsy to go a few muscle fibers, send it to pathologists and find out what's going on there. Um, could it be nutritional? Could it be a lack of omega-3s or the potassium, magnesium, selenium? Yeah, I would make sure he's on a decent multivitamin, cover any uh, trace mineral deficiencies, but that's really a seldom a cause for heart failure. Uh, but the, there's, there seems to be something that has injured the heart muscle directly. Um, again, the term probably is cardiomyopathy, unless there's a rhythm disturbance. Um, and you need to, to uh, look the cardiologist in the eye and say, what is the tissue diagnosis? Why is this man in, or woman in heart failure uh, with clean arteries? Uh, and, uh, and once you get the diagnosis, might be able to, if you want to contact me and do a consultation, once we get the diagnosis, I might be able to give you some guidance. Uh, but, but you need a diagnosis there. there there's, some, there's a problem with the heart muscle itself at this point. Got one back here. Hi, Dr. Clapper. I was wondering about um, omega-3s um, for long-term vegans, whole food, plant-based, no oil, no sugar. Um, the, we take the DHA, EPA the, in the algae oil. Um, we also have flax seed every day, ground flax every day. But I've, lately there's been a little bit of controversy with the DHA. I have a two-part question. One is how much weight do you give that? And two is should I be worried about the carrier oil in the DHA, EPA, LG? Uh, very sophisticated question. Okay, uh, she's asking about uh, the this group of long chain fats called omega-3 fats. You need some every day. The body, we can make them with the, out of the raw materials, um, the, uh, the linolenic acid that's in ground flax seeds. I'm glad she's putting some on her oatmeal every day. A handful of walnuts is a good idea. It's the nut with most omega-3s in it. Um, but omega-3 fats are so important to keep your brain healthy. And there have been some disturbing reports uh, over the years of vegans who don't consume enough of this omega-3s of, uh, of brain shrinkage and, and early dementia. Uh, and that's a concern. Uh, and it has me concerned enough that I've been taking um, a DHA capsule for years. Um, and, uh, and I suggest this person does as well. Now, um, yes, these omega-3s, this is what is found in fish oil. But fish don't make it, okay? Do not get your omega-3s out of fish oil. Um, the the omega-3, the true fats, are made by algae cells that float in the ocean. Um, the, the plants, again, make the omega-3s. Um, fish swim in the ocean with their mouths open, swallowing algae all day. And it's the algae oil that's winding up in the fish's muscle. Yes, you can kill the fish and crush its flesh and squeeze out the fish oil that has omega-3 fats in it. But it was, it was algae oil all along. Fish didn't make it. Um, and for that reason, because we're running out of fish and, uh, and it's not very good, um, they, they are now 
culturing these algae cells in big vats of fresh seawater and extracting the omega-3s out of the algae cells directly. They're leaving the middle fish out of the equation, which is a good thing to do. Uh, time to let the fish off the hook. So when she talks about algae-derived DHA, that's what she's talking about. This is uh, uh, omega-3 fats that have been derived directly from the algae, not from the fish. Uh, and I take the same thing uh, as well. Uh, and, and I suggest everybody does. Now, the reason why is because vegans even do even eat their walnuts and their flax oil, we're probably bottoming out on the, on the bare minimum amount of DHA to keep their, our brains healthy. And I don't want to take the risk. So, um, so this is a very low dose, 250 milligrams, 300 milligrams of DHA isn't much. I think it's enough to ward off the dementia. Uh, and so, and I think there's essentially zero risk in doing that. And, and I think uh, it's worthwhile doing to, to protect our brain. Now, there's been a whole big controversy that she referred to recently, Dr. Joel Furman and, and, uh, and Jeff Nelson from VegForce, we're going back and forth. And, um, and Jeff Nelson uh, is um, adamantly to say, uh, DHA is evil stuff and it's snake oil. Um, and anyone who's recommending it, uh, like I do, uh, is uh, just trying to extort money out of you and, uh, and unnecessary. Uh, and so that's been the controversy. I really think uh, that in this case, as much as I love Jeff Nelson, he's off base on this one. Uh, and the reason why is that the study he's citing showing that the AJA doesn't help. Yeah, they gave a bunch of regular American, Joe's six pack Americans eating their cheeseburgers and their pizzas with their clogged arteries um, there and their angina, uh, they took a bunch of them, and half um, they let eat their standard diet. The other half ate their standard diet, but took a DHA capsule as well. And lo and behold, the folks who were eating their cheeseburgers and, and pizzas, but also taking a DHA capsule, didn't notice any improvement uh, in their heart attack rate. Well, surprise, surprise. That's that one poor little DHA capsule to, to stop the onslaught in their arteries that they're creating every day is magical thinking. Of course, the DHA didn't. Um, didn't prevent heart attacks in those folks. But that does not mean that uh, low-dose DHA in long-term vegans isn't a good thing to keep their brains healthy. The two have nothing to do with each other, and Jeff has taken this one negative study on the heart disease and is saying all DHA is nonsense. Well, it's not Jeff. Uh, we're talking about a different phenomenon, uh, low-dose to prevent dementia. And, and, People who aren't getting omega threes from any place else, <laughs> the, the meat eaters do get DHA from the meat. They get cholesterol and everything else too. Um, so, um, so by and large, to settle this out, um, yes, I think you should continue taking that 250, 300 milligrams of DHA every day in a veggie cap or a squirt or whatever you like. Um, I do, and I, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. I think it'll pay off dividends and less dementia and long term vegans. We have uh, we hit the 7:30. <coughs> People need to uh, move. Okay, it's only 5.30 here. I'm having a good time. So go ahead, go ahead, whatever, whatever you're ready. A few more questions if you're up for them. Sure, no, I'm fine. There was somebody back here. Yep. I think we've got three or three or more. Sure, cool. Here, here. Hi, Dr. Clapper. I'm a big fan. Hi. I know you. I've seen so many of your videos. But um, I wanted to know what your thoughts or what you've seen in the science on fasting and more fasting for curing disease, because there's, there's a lot out there on all the benefits of fasting, but, and, and I'm not talking intermittent or even um, time restricted, I'm talking like long fast, five day fast. And specifically, I have a friend who's going to an integrative doctor for, or uh, somebody for integrative medicine that's um, you know fighting lymphoma. And she's having these five day fast once a month. and, and Again, I'm just wondering, does the science support that for curing disease? Wow, very important, sophisticated, ancient, modern question here. Um, fasting's been going on for thousands of years. Uh, and I've, I've supervised hundreds of fasts up at True North uh, Health Center. It's a very powerful modality. The, the body resets itself in the fasting state when you're just drinking water. <laughs> and it turns off inflammation, it turns off cancer growth, we had two lymphomas melt away uh, at our clinic uh, on long fast. Now, lots in your question regarding intermittent fasting, et cetera. To make a long story short, I really apply, if I heard correctly, and she's got an integrative medical doc who's recommending a five-day fast once a month 
kudos to that doc and to her. She should absolutely do that. By day five of a water fast, her cells have, are cleaning themselves out. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the science, there, is, there are molecules called sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S, sirtuins, appear in the, in, the, in the tissues by day four or five, and they turn off cancer growth. Uh, we're just learning about them. There is a science behind this. If you do a search on fasting and cancer, uh, you'll screen, your screen will fill up with a study showing that not only does water fasting have a, um, uh, an anti-cancer effect in its, on its own uh, due to the sirtuins that build up, et cetera, but also, as Dr. Walter Longo from the University of Southern California is showing us, um, if you then uh, take uh, chemotherapy for, and for any cancer, but you, but you do it on day four or five of a fast, you get a tremendously exaggerated, potentiated response where chemo works much better on day four or five of a water fast. In fact, I've been telling my breast cancer ladies, I tell them to, don't say anything to the oncologist, it scares them. But if you're due for a chemo session, go in on day four or five of a water fast, you're going to get a much better response from this thing. Plus, you're going to have less nausea and vomiting and lightheadedness, all that stuff, if you don't have anything in your stomach anyway. Um, so, um, so yes, there's a science behind this. Um, she's doing the right thing. We would all benefit, the truth of it was, we all eat too much, too often. Uh, we'd all benefit from a four or five day fast once a month. Uh, when, you know, a million years ago on the African savanna, probably that was the standard. Our, our ancient foraging ancestors probably was common that you'd go four or five days before you found the next berry bush with fruit on it or the uh, next, next food source. And, and these slipping into intermittent fast is probably common. And our body thrives on it. It really cleans out our tissues. Uh, for hours on the physiology of fasting, but it has a potent anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer effect, and those five-day fasts once a month are a great idea for that patient and for all of us, the truth of it is. Um, the more you read about fasting, the more you'll learn about that. Yeah, she's doing the right thing. Other questions? Um, did you hear that? Would you no, I didn't. Add a, a specific brand of that uh, EPA, DHA, the algae based, uh, and uh, are there other supplements you recommend taking on a daily basis? Yeah, um, okay, so, and I'm glad you're recording this if it goes by quickly here, but um, uh, DHA, um, most, most of them get, they buy it from this wholesaler called Martech, and they, everybody just rebrands the stuff they get from Martech. Um, but I, um, uh, I take Dr. Furman's uh, DHA, it's a liquid. Uh, if you go to his website, drfurman.com, uh, F-U-H-R-M-A-N.com, you'll know, click on shop where you'll see his vitamins. Um, and I also take his, his daily multivitamin. I have no financial connection with Dr. Furman's vitamin sales. But he did do something with his vitamins that as soon as I saw it, I said, ooh, that was a good idea. I should have thought of that. Um, there are vitamins we now know that are too, power, too potent. Vitamin A causes hip fractures, beta carotene drives cancer growth, folic acid gives women breast cancers. Dr. Furman took all those evil things out of his multivitamins, toned everything way down. Uh, the, he only has a few vitamins left, but the five that he left are the five that vegans uh, have the most challenge getting. B12, he covers your B12 with that, with, with um, I think uh, 150 micrograms a day. Iodine for your thyroid, he's got 150 micrograms of iodine in there. Vitamin D, for because we're not out in the sunshine anymore, he, he includes 2,000 of D in there. Zinc can be tough for a, um, for a, uh, uh, vegans to get, so he puts 50 milligrams of, of zinc in there, um, and uh, D, B12, um, zinc, iodine, uh, and he's got some selenium um, uh, as well for, uh, for tissue health. Um, so, um, so I just take uh, two of his in the morning, and that takes care of all my vitamins and minerals, and then I take a squirt of his DHA liquid when I'm done. So that, that's my whole regimen. Uh, anything close to that, most of the DHA, they're, they're basically, as I said, come from the same wholesaler. I don't think there's much difference in the brands. 
uh, and although Furman's is refrigerated, so it's fresher, uh, which is why I use his. Uh, and uh, anything that approximates uh, Dr. Furman, he's got a women's daily and a men's daily. I take his men's daily, you take his women's daily, but they're both they're essentially the same formulation. So we we had, one uh, more, I have two more questions, and then we do have to. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, one of them has to do with how long does it take uh, if you are you are diabetic and you do start, uh, let's say, a whole food diet. Uh, about how long does it take the insulin receptors to begin to open up and begin? Oh, right. Oh, within, often within five to seven days, you notice changes. Within two to three weeks, you will definitely be noticing changes. And you must, please, tell your doctor that, doctor, I'm adopting a healthier diet. You don't have to say plant-based and just say, I'm adopting a healthier diet. Probably going to lose some weight. Uh, will you follow me along in case we need to reduce uh, the dosage of uh, medication? Which you will. Uh, but definitely tell your doc that. And as soon as you start getting lowish blood sugar values, um, you have, you start waking up with blood sugars in the 60s and 70s and 80s, whatever. You get on the phone and you tell the doctor, tell his nurse, I woke up with blood sugar of me. Don't you think we should lower my metformin? Don't you think we should lower my insulin? Whatever it is. And you keep in, in touch with them. But you absolutely expect your dosage of medications to go down. Um, and... Uh, certainly within four to six weeks, you will definitely be noticing changes. You'll have lost some weight, and you'll have less needs for medications, and it's going to and it will continue over the next three to six to twelve to eighteen months. So uh, work with your doctor, but it, it happens fairly quickly. Don't go hypoglycemic. The most feared thing is to have a low blood sugar reaction while you're sleeping. Now, uh, don't take a chance on that. You're, if you've got a low blood sugar in the evening, uh, take a little carbohydrate and tell your doctor in the morning. Uh, so, uh, but work with your doctor's office, expect the changes to happen soon. And one last question. Okay. Dr. Esselstyn and his wife were in Milwaukee several years ago. They gave talks for three or four days at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Wauwatosa. Have you tried them? No, we actually had Dr. Clapper and I talked about that earlier today. He would love to speak to them. Oh, I'd love to. Yes. Uh, we'll make that happen. I will be out there within the, within this calendar year, next 12, 18 months. I I will be in front of that audience at Medical College of Wisconsin. I promise. If you want, I'll, I'll ask, I'll talk to them. Oh, yeah, okay. Give me some names and numbers. And give me some contact folks there. Yes. Outstanding. Great. Well, Dr. Klepper, thank you so much. for. <laughs> thank you, guys. Blessings. Thank you. Well, I know that I'm a big fan of you. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Keep meeting. Keep talking about this. Set a good example. Get yourself healthy. Be happy. Don't make this uh, an ordeal. Uh, this is health. This is delicious food. And you'll save the world. You'll save the animals. You'll save the world for your children, your grandchildren. So eat plants, and you'll be rewarded. So uh, go Badger.